Uh, John, uh, as well as being Emeritus Professor at the University of Edinburgh, he's also leading the Urban Law Project for the BSS. Okay, so those who don't know me, <clears throat> I'm Emeritus Professor at Edinburgh University. Most of my research life has been working on plant ecophysiology, tree lines in Scotland, CO2 flux in Brazil and Europe. And when I retired from the university, I decided that uh, I would get a bit more local. And um, I thought that the urban flora was something that had been <coughs> neglected. And so with my colleagues in the Botanical Society, we began a project on the urban flora in Scotland. That's the background. Uh, I think that um, some of you already know what we do because I've had a little <coughs> spot <coughs> in this meeting um, for the last few years. What we aim to do is to record the urban flora of Scotland with, with habitat information. And we started this in 2015. And by now we've got um, 60,000 plus records and we've got about 1,500 species. I think that um, we, we differ from the uh, Botanical Society of the British Isles in that we, we, we are interested in habitat. We're interested in the process of urbanization. And uh, I might just say that um, urbanization is of course a global issue. Most people in the world live in cities and plants live in cities as well. And we need to know how the process of urbanization affects plant life. And that's really what the project is about. Now, um, what we do is we, we, we go out, we record at um, places all, all over Scotland, any town or city with a population greater than a thousand counts for us as a town or city. And uh, what we do is we, uh, we, we categorize our records according to the habitats where we are. And we have 10 habitats uh, in, our, in our survey. And you can see what they are there. They're um, agricultural gardens, roads, buildings, and so on. And each one of those is subdivided. Uh, so um, roads, which you see on the left there, uh, that's a broad, a broad habitat type and it includes paths and pavements, footpaths, cycle paths, pavements, railway embankments, railway cuttings, roadsides, and, and roads themselves. And likewise, on the right-hand side, broadheading gardens includes all kinds of things such as churchyards, golf courses, public park, school, business grounds, supermarket car parks. Supermarket car parks, quite good hunting ground quite often. And, and um, each one of these uh, habitats has a code. So we record and we put our data into a database called iRecord, which uh, we can later download. And just to give you some impression of what we find, uh, these are the top 20 most frequently recorded species for three broad habitat types. So we've got roads and gardens, which I've mentioned already, and we've got buildings, I've added buildings to this, and you can see the number of records for these species. Uh, you, might, you might say, um, well, isn't, isn't, that, um, isn't, isn't that not surprising that you've got um, in gardens, daisies are very common, and in, along roadsides, um, Senechia vulgaris, growing on pavements is, is pretty common. And that's right. Um, so we don't ignore common species. We've heard a lot in this meeting about rare species, but the common species are important as well. And of course, each one of these lists is really um, about a thousand species long. Uh, and we've got many, many species that are rare and recorded only once or twice in our entire record. If you look at buildings. Interestingly, most of these are, are plants that live on, on walls. Uh, I think um, in the literature, we can find the term murophyte from murus, the Latin for wall. 
And when I talked about roads last time, last year, I, I, I coined the term cracophytes, which are the plants that live in cracks. And there are many plants that live in cracks that you find in, um, in these habitats. So that's, that's all about the, the what we, re we record and where do we record, but um, we're interested in why are the plants uh, in those habitats. And um, to, to determine the why, we, we refer to a database or two databases, uh, which were um, produced by Mark Hill and his colleagues in the Center for Ecology and Hydrology. And what these do is um, they, um, they bring together lists of species and they show you the attributes of these species. So such things as whether they're annual or perennial, whether they're alien or native, uh, what kind of temperature regime do they prefer and so on. And we've applied this approach to bryophytes because there's, there's both, um, originally there was only plant at, which is the attributes of vascular plants, and then came bryoat, which is the attributes of bryophytes. So we've, um, we've applied both of these uh, databases to our own data uh, to find out um, there's something about the, the preferences of the species that we find. And by the way, you can download these databases, uh, PlantAt and BryoAt, and the, um, the address of, of those databases is shown there at the bottom. So we're interested in spatial changes and the attributes of species. And uh, <clears throat> these databases also include Ellenberg's indicator values. <clears throat> Ellenberg, he was um, a German ecologist. He's looking very grim in that photograph. And what he did was um, he developed nine point scales to indicate the species preferences for major environmental variables. So some of those I've shown there. So uh, for, for any species, he, he, he has um, some um, indication of their, their reaction preferences, that is pH, their nitrogen or soil fertility preferences, soil moisture, salinity, light, temperature, and, and quite a few others. And um, uh, Mark Hill, he took, he took these attributes and he built them in to plant at. And he did this for 1,888 species. So quite a lot of the entire British flora are now um, covered by um, Mark Hill's database. Now the first um, sub project I'll tell you about is a survey along the water of Leith. And this survey was done by David Chamberlain and his team. And the data analysis was done by Julie Wilson. And there's uh, David identifying something very small. And you can see the, um, the map of the water of Leith from the source in the Pentland Hills and uh, flowing into Bellano, across the Ring Road, into the city centre and finally to the docks. And if you look at the attributes of those bryophytes on the left, on the x-axis, that's um, somewhere up in the Pentland Hills and on the right, that's um, down in Leith at the docks. And we can see the percentage of species that fall into different categories. In this case, it's pH. So where we've got red bars on the histogram, that's low pH. It's the same color scheme as litmus paper to make things easy. And you can see that um, in, the, in the early stages of the river, the, um, the bryophytes are those that like low pHs. And then um, as we move into the, into the town, these tend to go away and, and the plants that prefer high pHs uh, come into play. And then we can do the same kind of thing with the bryophytes for nitrogen. And we can see that the plants that are found up in the Pentland Hills are plants that often, not always, but often are preference plants for low nitrogen. And as we move down into the city, we move into nitrophiles, 
nitrogen loving plants. Not, not all of them, of course, but we, we see this, this systematic trend. So that is very interesting and it lets us understand how plants, how in this case, graphites are distributed in, in the way they are. Now, I, I've tried something which I want to tell you about because this involves uh, BSBI data. So um, I try to do something like this, but in this case, instead of um, walking the whole length from Glasgow to Edinburgh along the M8, which would have taken me too long, I use the BSBI data. So what I've done, I've sampled the BSBI data from the digital database and I've taken 10 kilometer by 10 kilometer ordnance survey grid squares as the sample. So I've uh, collected the data up using the internet for these nine um, squares uh, coming into this little dog leg at the end to get to Edinburgh. And uh, what you find is, is this, so the blue indicates all the species and you can see the number of species as we move from city to city the number of species declines from glasgow down to a minimum somewhere in the middle of the belt and then um, it goes up again and um, if we look at the um the red is 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 the the um the alien species and those um, show a similar trend but but rather more so and what we find is if we would try to relate this to the extent of urbanization, we find that um, you can do this. If you take an index of urbanization, and I've taken the logarithm of the human population in each one of these squares, and the logarithm of the human population is related to the total number of species, and the percentage of aliens that you find is also related to the logarithm of the number of species as an index of urbanization. I could have taken the number of pubs or the number of churches or something else, but I took the log of the human population. And if we look at the temperatures from which this, these collections of species come, we find something very interesting. We find that in, um, this is the January mean temperature from which the plants come for the whole of the British Isles. And we find that um, for the January temperature and for the July temperature, the ones in the cities in Glasgow and Edinburgh are from warmer climes. Uh, and, and the alien species are even more from warmer climes. And uh, I think in my last uh, talk a year ago, I made this point that many of the species coming from the south, they go first into Edinburgh and Glasgow and then they gradually uh, colonize the central belt because Edinburgh and Glasgow are very slightly warmer. They have warmer microclimates than elsewhere. And if we do the same for pre precipitation, we can get um, a, somewhat, a somewhat similar pattern, rather analogous pattern there. There are differences um, as you move along the transect. Plants that like drier conditions are more likely found in the main cities and um, not so much in the center of the central belt. And uh, something similar happens if you look at pH, the pH reaction and the nitrogen, we find that the aliens are, uh, particularly tend to be calcicoles. Uh, they, they like higher pHs. And you also find that the aliens tend to prefer sites with higher nitrogen availability. So that's, that's more or less it. And um, the work package for 2022, we want to extend the data set. Uh, we haven't covered um, an, anything like all the towns and cities. We can no, only ever hope to do a sample. Um, we want to complete this analysis of bryophytes and uh, the central belt. Uh, I'm interested in the parameterization of urbanization. I've talked only about human population. We want to look at things like um, green space, uh, cover by buildings and other possible surrogates that are an index of urbanization. And then we want to move towards synthesis. 
So um, many thanks for your attention. I would like to thank all those people that helped. And um, you can see them here. We've got a core team. We've got registered recorders. We've got partner organizations. Uh, we wouldn't have been able to do this without iRecord, which is the um, system, the database operated by the Biological Records Center. And um, from 2021, we very much appreciate the help from the BSBI, help with recording, but even more important, help with expertise. And uh, with, with their help, I think we can bring this project to a good conclusion in, in a couple of years or so. So thank you very much for your attention. Brilliant, John, thank you so much. Jim, uh, we've got just a few minutes for questions. Jonathan Shanklin asks, interesting that the mosses don't occur in the frequent list in gardens, but they are on the buildings list. Is that a recorder effect? I think it's a recorder bias. I think that if you're a recorder uh, and you're interested in bryophytes, you're more likely to look at walls and buildings than you are poking about in, in, in gardens, which generally isn't very good hunting ground. <laughs> <laughs> I think with all botanical recording, there is a challenge, and this applies to BSBI as well. There is a challenge because we we tend to go to the places where we think we're going to find stuff, and and that's actually not very scientific. But it's impossible to do random sampling. Human nature being what it is, it just doesn't work. <laughs> uh, and there's another interesting question here: uh, Does I record link in with the BSBI database? Uh, well, I, perhaps I should answer that one. <laughs> uh, we, we do get uh, frequent uh, updates of I record records. Uh, they don't go straight into our database, they go into a holding area um, and they're uh, checked by Vice County recorders before uh, being added to the, the main database. Um, and we also make, as, as John's uh, mentioned, we make our records available to BSS for uh, their analysis of, of this data set. Um, and we'd love more people in the BSBI to, to get involved in the project. Uh, it's a great project to get involved in because it's right in your doorstep, uh, most likely. Um, and there's lots of useful information on the BSS website on the Urban Flora Project and how, how to get involved. Um, thank you, John. Thank you, Jim. Thank you. Thanks, John.